testing. Hello. Okay, it's working. Okay. Let's do this. Here comes someone. Good morning. Okay, good morning. Let's go ahead and get this uh, workshop started. Uh, so we, have a, we have a very full agenda, so um, we're going to go get right to it. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Albrecht. I'm an engineer in the State Water Board and the Div Division of Financial Assistance. Uh, also participating in this morning's workshop uh, from the division is Leslie Loudon, who was recently promoted uh, to branch chief of the cleanup and bonds branch. Next is the brand new supervisor of our unit, um, Robert Reeves. Today is Robert's first day on the job. Welcome aboard. <laughs> uh, finally, we have uh, my colleagues, Brandon Davison and Sarah Gatsky. Um, Brandon will be helping with the application as assistance uh, presentation later, and Sarah, well, Sarah has taken a new position, so this will be her last workshop working with us. So. Um, moving on, uh, we're going to begin the morning with a, an introduction to low impact development. Uh, so you, you will see all the concepts and uh, hopefully visualize these features uh, and how they could be integrated into your project site. Uh, Kevin Perry will be uh, from Urban Rain Design will be giving that presentation um, uh, for about 45 minutes and then we'll have some question and answer time avail available at the end of that. After that, uh, we have a special guest from the Division of State Architect, Jim Hackett. Jim is a principal structural engineer with uh, DSA, and he will be providing some input on how uh, these proposed projects will be reviewed and some of the design considerations. Uh, and then next, we will begin the application assistance portion. Uh, Brandon and I will be tag teaming that presentation. Uh, and then finally, we will have uh, Ibyong Rivera from our uh, division giving a presentation on the Financial applica Assistance Application Submittal Tool, or FAST, uh, so everyone can become familiar with that system and uh, receive some tips on submitting proposals. Uh, and finally, we will all be hanging around here. If you want to have some one-on-one -on -one question time at the very end, feel free to have a conversation. We'll also have a, a, a laptop available to uh, to try to tinker with the uh, FAST system. If you want to set up a, a, a login account, you can do that too. Okay, before we begin, we need to do our uh, obligatory um, in case of emergency statement. I'll just say for those of you joining us on the webcast, you'll have to do your own emergency evacuation plan. Uh, but for those in the room, please look around you now and identify two exits closest to you. Um, in some uh, cases, an exit may be behind you. In the event of a fire alarm, we are required to evacuate this room. 
Please take your valuables with you and do not use the elevators. While staff will endeavor to assist you in to the nearest exit, you should also know that you may find an exit by following the ceiling mounted exit signs. Evacuate, eva excuse me, evacuees will exit down the stairways and possibly to a relocation site across the street. If you cannot use stairs, you will be directed to a protective vestibule inside a stairwell. Should we have to relo relocate out of the building, please obey all traffic signals and exercise caution crossing the street. Uh, in addition, we have restrooms out and to the left, um, past the large glass sculpture along with drinking fountains. Okay, uh, now I believe we are ready to start the uh, introduction to low impact design. So, Kevin, please. Great, thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everybody, in person and on the web. I'm going to get this presentation up and running here. Okay, uh, again, my name is Kevin Perry. I'm a principal with Urban Rain Design, and I'm a landscape architect. And it's a pleasure to talk with you all today about um, how low impact development can be applied to school settings. Um, just a quick outline of what we're going to be doing today with this presentation. Uh, just a couple of basic parts. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, for the uh, three basic parts here, we're going to look at how we can rethink how rain and stormwater is managed um, throughout the sites, uh, and also just looking at how low impact development or LID can really make a difference in um, the overall urban environment, but specifically with schools, and also just go over some of the technical assistance that through this project we will be giving to um, school parties for the, the drop application period. For those of you that are on online right now, uh, if you have any questions during this pr presentation or even afterwards, this is the email to, to send your questions to and we'll field those questions and then uh, I'm going to go through this presentation and then uh, we'll answer the questions afterwards. So part one, rethinking stormwater management. Now uh, it seems lately, um, maybe not lately, but uh, in recent years, we were kind of living in two different extremes. We have wet, extreme wet periods and very, very dry periods. Obviously, we're in a dry period. But when we're looking at low impact development, uh, it's really looking at water holistically in that uh, we, can't, we can't gauge what the weather's gonna do, we can't predict the weather, but what we can do is look at how we've built our urban environment and respond to these conditions. And that's really what low impact development is. And if we look at the natural landscape before we started to build that natural environment, we had a scenario much like this where when it did rain, a lot of that water would be captured in uh, a tree canopy and it would be evaporated back into the, uh, into the air. And if that water did make it to the, the ground surface, it would move very, very slowly. And when it would hit the ground surface, it would either go into um, the soil, again, very slowly, or it would move along the surface at a relatively um, slow pace. As we've built our urban environment, that has been overturned with a much different scenario. When it rains, that water immediately hits hard surface because we've replaced what was natural landscape with building rooftops, parking lots, and streets, all impervious surface. So we get very little water that's actually infiltrating into the, thank you. We get very little water that actually is going into the ground and ma majority of that is quickly taken into an underground pipe infrastructure and whisks, whisked off site, out of sight, out of mind. And the, uh, the process is relatively simple. We have excess areas of impervious area. When it rains, it goes into the pipe system. A lot of the pipe system we don't even see. In this particular example in the slide, we actually do have some underground pipes that are daylighted. And then, of course, along with that runoff, we have trash, pollutant loads that are going into, um, eventually into waterways without pretreatment within the landscape. Just some uh, examples of how we've really, uh, as we've built our urban conditions, how we've devalued the water as a resource. And our conventional way of developing 
the landscape or the built environment has some profound effects in that um, the more we put in uh, impervious surfaces, the less water we can actually get into our underground aquifers. And so this is a basic scenario of what's been happening here in California for uh, the last couple of years as we move from you know, a relatively low drought situation into a more and more ser serious situation. The idea of trying to get the water into the ground whenever it rains, and yesterday it did rain in Northern California, uh, to be able to get that water into the ground is, is, is paramount for recharging that aquifer. And this is actually a picture that I had taken yesterday uh, along a street. And wouldn't it be great to capture this water and get it into the ground? This is, after all, our water that's coming from the sky. More often than not, it's put into an uh, underground piped environment. And so when we're looking at an ultra-urban situation or even a suburban, suburban situation, we have high amounts of impervious area, lots of asphalt, lots of concrete that's inhibiting that water to get into the ground naturally. Uh, for those of you that enjoy cartoons, this is kind of the similar uh, situation where we have the, the case on the, the left showing kind of a typical more urban condition and then on the right is looking at ways to introduce more landscape and get water moving in a more natural condition. So sustainable stormwater management, Earl ID, what's so special about this particular parking lot that I have on the slide? Well, it embodies two core principles of LID. One, we want to create more pervious surface so when it does rain, that water can go into the ground more easily. And even if that water can't get into the ground, there's landscape areas that are very, very close by that can accept that runoff. And so, you know, parking lots, we like LID people, we like to dwell on parking lots and uh, geek out over them, but this is the basic thing. More perviousness and more landscape. So, and looking in more specifically about low impact development, if you can think of it and more define it in such a way, it's basically utilizing design techniques that reduce the impacts of urbanization. And we want to try to mimic that natural hy hydrologic cycle, slowing that water, cleaning it, infiltrating it into the ground whenever we can. Uh, within the uh, grant LID uh, application brief, there's several techniques that are, that are listed there. And this is not even a complete listing, but you can certainly utilize bioretention basins, vegetated swales, filter strips, just taking out impervious area and replacing it with landscaping is certainly an excellent tool. You can use that with pervious pavers. What about capturing runoff from rooftops? We can harvest it or we can route it into nearby landscape areas. Um, definitely utilizing uh, trees whenever possible. And then uh, for those sites that have the availability of land nearby, actually creating larger areas, constructed wetlands is certainly an excellent technique to look into. And then as I mentioned before, just replacing asphalt concrete with more drought tolerant uh, uh, plant material or even replacing lawn conditions and putting in more drought tolerant uh, material is certainly an, an excellent LID technique. For the next couple of minutes, I want to hit upon some really common uh, design strategies. And this isn't even uh, an exhaustive list in any way, but uh, I'm showcasing six examples or six design techniques that are commonly used not just in urban conditions, but on school sites as well. So one of them is vegetated swales, uh, stormwater planters, rain gardens, pervious paving systems, rainwater harvesting, and then just utilizing water-wise landscapes. So we're going to look at each one of these uh, techniques a little bit deeper. So a vegetated swale, what is it? It's basically a really shallow landscape area that's recessed. So it's uh, dipping down into the ground ever so slightly, and it's used to capture, convey, and if the soil conditions are right, to infiltrate water. Why would you use a vegetated swale over uh, any other LID situation? Swales have been around for a long time. They've, people have been using them for, for decades. So it's a widely accepted strategy. They also are relatively inexpensive to uh, implement. They don't require a lot of infrastructure or engineering that is associated with them. It's just basically manipulating the landscape. So instead of, it, instead of being concave, or excuse me, convex, a hump, it's more concave, so it's a, it allows water to collect in these areas. 
Some constraints, though, is that uh, swales, by definition, are typically very, very long uh, linear systems, and a lot of times there's uh, utilities or uh, driveway cuts that break up that space. So the conditions have to be right you know, where you have a long linear space for swales to, to exist. And then if you're looking at um, parking lot or street uh, situations, making sure that these are designed so that people don't trample through the landscape is important because we're looking at kind of longer systems. Um, making sure that uh, people can move through the landscape effectively is an important design consideration. The other example, or number two example, are stormwater planters. And unlike swales, um, they're really used to capture um, a fair amount of volume of water. And they're contained landscapes, vertically contained, where swales are a little bit more freeform. Uh, planters have vertical sidewalls, and they're really good in uh, urban situations or areas where we have we're tight in space. And uh, I kind of went through just a couple of the reasons why you would choose a stormwater planter, but uh, because they can fit into nooks and crannies and be a lot of different types of shapes and sizes, they're really, really good uh, for avoiding utilities, street trees, driveway curb cuts. Um, and so they're, they're really good with that. And they can also retain a bit more volume than a stormwater swale might do. The overall constraint of using a stormwater planter is because we're containing this landscape system, uh, it requires a little bit more infrastructure, a little concrete uh, to actually create this containment system. And keep in mind, the concrete that I'm talking about is on the side, uh, side system. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be contained on the bottom. We can infiltrate this water into the ground. Sometimes you can't, sometimes you can. But I just want to reinforce that when we're talking about planter systems, when we're containing the landscape, it's just on the sides. Another strategy widely used um, is our, our rain gardens. And basically, rain gardens are larger areas. And they can be any form, really, that can accept storm water. And they're really there to uh, accept a large amount of storm water, retain it, and hold it as much as possible. Why would you choose a rain garden? Well, they can often significantly uh, green a space. And a lot of the projects that I've worked on for the last couple of years is taking out asphalt and replacing it with, with landscape that it can, can accept storm water. So you can make a big uh, improvement on a particular site by introducing rain gardens. And because of their larger size, they can provide the most stormwater benefit as well. They can be any shape or size. It could be rectangular, it could be triangular, it could be freeform, circular. So there's a lot of uh, uh, ability to adapt the shape of a rain garden to your particular site. Now, uh, because they're large, the, the big constraint of utilizing a rain garden is just the associated maintenance with a larger landscape space. because all landscape requires some base level of, of, of maintenance, and the larger it is, the more of that needs to be considered uh, for your site. And then in some cases where we have uh, tight space conditions, we just don't have the room to fit in a rain garden. However, schools being what they are, there are uh, a lot of uh, larger spaces that uh, can uh, accommodate a rain garden. Pervious paving, another great technique, uh, and basically, uh, by definition, impervious paving allows water to either pass through the paving course itself, or you have a pervious paving system that has joints in between individual pavers that allows water to move through the crack system. And there's a lot of materiality that you, one can choose from for looking at pervious paving. Um, What's great about uh, pervious paving is that as soon as that water hits that surface, the water moves into the ground very, very quickly. Uh, they can provide um, a lot of stormwater benefit. And what's great is that by combining pervious paving systems with landscape systems, you kind of get a two for one punch. First, the moves through the pervious paving and any sort of overflow, if that could be redirected to the landscape, is um, fantastic. The uh, constraint is that oftentimes when you have uh, a paving system, they can be a little bit more expensive to build and a little bit more technologically challenging to put in than a landscape system. Rainwater harvesting, an excellent technique as well. And basically it's the ability to capture water 
and store it either for reuse or allow it to slowly move back into the landscape system where it can recharge the underground aquifer. Excellent situation and a, kind of a no-brainer is taking water from building rooftops and being able to re redirect it into cisterns. And uh, the benefits of this are, are, are uh, quite numerous. Um, obviously, it can be captured to re-irrigate um, or irrigate adjacent landscape systems, and oftentimes irrigating the very uh, stormwater, the, you know, the LID technique that's right next to the cistern can be used for, uh, for irrigation. Again, they can be made of a lot of different materials and uh, shapes and sizes. We have a metal container, a metal cistern shown in this particular slide, but there's a lot of different products out there that could be uh, put into place. They can be above ground cisterns, they can be below ground cisterns. And the really nice thing about having an above ground cistern is that it's an extremely tangible tool for education, showing people that this is the water, we're saving it, we're conserving it for when we need it the most. Some constraints is that even though it's a relatively simple idea of collecting water, um, it needs a little bit more operational support than a passive system of just letting water move into a landscape. You need to regulate, okay, how much water do I have in this cistern? Uh, when is the right time to feed, uh, feed the uh, adjacent landscape with, with irrigation? And then being in the climate that we are in, a lot of our rainfall comes in the winter time, the fall and the spring, but when we need that water is in our dry months. So um, the ability to try to store this water and reuse it in the time that we need it most is, is often challenging. But that also moves right into um, our last strategy that we're going to hit upon is just utilizing water-wise landscaping. And uh, what we're talking about here is perhaps switching out um, thirsty plant material like turf grass and replacing it with California native plant material or even adaptable ornamental uh, plants that require less water um, overall. Uh, a lot of these things are kind of uh, obvious, but it's, it's good to touch upon them. But, uh, you know, using water-wise landscaping, they can of often absorb more uh, water than turf grass does because turf grass is very, very dense. Um, utilizing these other, the other plant material that has a deeper root system can actually absorb stormwater much more uh, effectively, and then it can conserve water equally during the uh, dry conditions. Relatively to cheap to uh, convert lawn over to uh, these types of plant material, and vice versa, taking uh, asphalt out and replacing it with this type of a system is, is excellent because the, it basically is taking impervious area out of the system and putting in a more water-wise landscape system. And then you can take downspout water from rooftops and direct it into these uh, water-wise uh, landscape systems, even if it's not a formal swale or a rain garden or a planter, just allowing that water to move into the, this type of plant material is excellent. So this, the constraint of, of utilizing this type of plant material is that people are still getting used to um, putting in California natives and adaptable ornament, ornamental plants. We're, we're very used to having lawn situations, uh, so the maintenance is going to be a little bit different. So there needs to be a little bit of education and training with that. And then, like I said, we're, we're used to seeing kind of lawn conditions. So the aesthetics of moving from one condition that we're used to for so long into uh, a different type of aesthetic takes uh, takes a little time. The good news is that LID, all these strategies I just talked about, they fit in a lot of different contexts. Uh, and all these things are applicable to school sites. We have streets, parking lots, we have the buildings, and then the overall site. And so there's always a technique that one can utilize to retrofit and change the built environment, especially with schools. So let's look at schools in a little bit more depth. Um, you know, it, looking at existing school conditions, you know, if, 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 if they're lucky, if the, if the kids are lucky, they have, you know, a robust landscape that looks something like this. But more often than not, it's a condition like this with high amounts of impervious area, and the quality of the space is, isn't necessarily that great. Now, that's not to say that this is the case everywhere, but in a lot of cases, um, this is what we have. We have portable classrooms, again, high amounts of impervious area, 
but these are great uh, conditions in that it's, it's almost, it's just begging for a retrofit opportunity. Parking lots are often uh, designed relatively poorly. The efficiency of the parking lot, the way that the stalls, the parking lot stalls are striped with very long travel aisles or very long parking spaces. And we can tighten up this efficiency and start to um, put in uh, a more efficient design. And then we have large expanses of, of play area, which is great to, for the kids to be able to go out and, and play at recess or lunchtime. But is, it, is there a way to, again, make this space more efficient and reintroduce landscape to, um, to manage stormwater better? And as I mentioned before, we're often used to lawn conditions, and this is all too common in school sites, is where basically you have asphalt, concrete, and lawn, um, all of which um, aren't helping the stormwater situation or water conservation situation. So when you look at um, some common elements of school sites, there's great potential to retrofit um, with LID. An example are interior courtyard spaces. Perhaps this space here in the center that I've outlined in, in red could be transformed into uh, a better environment, not only for the kids to be in, but also to manage stormwater in a different way, such as this. This is an example of a retrofit that I did several years ago, actually in, in Portland State University campus, where this was all impervious area, and then we surgically introduced uh, landscape and seating into uh, kind of a courtyard situation. There's also situations, not just in the interior, but the perimeter of school spaces. And keep in mind, uh, you know, there is established landscape here, but I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but there's a series of downspouts that are rooted from the building, and they're just going into the pipe system. We can repurpose this landscape area and uh, utilize the very techniques that we just talked about, whether it be uh, just connecting a downspout or routing that water into a cistern that ultimately goes into a landscape area. It's kind of a, a graphical example, and this is actually built, a built example of, again, redirecting downspout water into repurposed uh, landscaping that's much more high performance than what we typically see today. I mentioned uh, roof downspouts all too often. They're just connected right from the uh, roof and to the pipe system. There's two of them here. Being able to accentuate the value of water, allowing that water to move onto the surface into adjacent landscape areas. And these, these spaces, these landscape areas, don't have to be necessarily very big, but just being able to make that connection and get that water into the ground is, is very, very important. Even perimeter areas around schools, again, I talked about kind of these uh, uh, asphalt play areas as being important but maybe inefficiently designed. There's opportunities at the edges of these asphalt areas where water is sheet flow running off to repurpose those, those spaces. This is an example in Calgary. I was up there last year where it was exactly that. That used to be lawn. There was an adjacent asphalt play area and they just repurposed this landscape to accept stormwater management. And then parking lots themselves can be completely redesigned. This is an example of a parking lot that um, has very wide uh, parking, or excuse me, very long parking stalls and very wide uh, driveway aisles. And when you look at that condition, we can look at repurposing and making a more efficient site design to allow for stormwater management. And we're going to look at that a little bit later in more detail. But even um, student gathering areas for lunchtime, those are certainly um, areas that are very, very vis visible could use some more landscaping in most situations. And we can uh, parcel out certain areas for, for landscape but still have the everyday function of gathering. Uh, this is, an, uh, is not a school uh, example, but it's, it's that idea of allowing more landscape to kind of creep into these um, more gathering spaces. And this is a, a beautiful example of, of doing exactly that. Or utilizing just pervious paving. This is a park uh, project here. Uh, where the areas where the trees are have been uh, retrofitted with a pervious paving system. You can see the center aisle, you can see the kind of the glaze of water there, that's impervious, but the areas where the trees are are, are very much pervious. 
our streets that are adjacent to school uh, conditions are also excellent uh, opportunities to retrofit with uh, a wide variety of techniques. And again, it's looking at the overall efficiency of, of the built environment. Uh, so can we take out a portion of this parking zone that isn't utilized for parking much of the time and reintroduce landscape? And you can do it in such a way where that water can move into that landscape. And now this is a project that I completed over a decade ago in, in Portland called the Northeast Siskiyou Green Street. And uh, it was put in uh, with the idea that it was, it's the first of its kind to take out a portion of the parking zone and allow that water to move in. And it was very efficient and um, cost effective to build these types of systems. We can combine the idea of what we call stormwater curb extension or, or bulb outs that have landscape that route stormwater through this condition, but combine it with um, ADA accessible school crossings. And this is one of the first that, again, were done, was done that I put in several years ago. There was no ADA accessible crossing here, but we combined green infrastructure with safe routes to schools. And we now have kind of two conditions that are working great together. And so it narrows the crossing distance, but allows water to move into that landscape. This is an example, a more rural example, where um, kids, there's a, a school that's just adjacent to this, this street. There was no sidewalk, and there was no stormwater management, but we were able to, again, surgically retrofit an, a, a strip of landscaping uh, in the form of a swale and introduce a pervious paving sidewalk. So, being able to combine these techniques, more safety and stormwater management is an important consideration. In this particular example, they actually uh, closed off a portion of the, the street to only allow bikes and pedestrians through this uh, street condition. This is right next to an elementary school, again in Portland, where we have uh, planter systems, landscaping, new landscaping, and uh, it's working very, very beautifully. So I wanted to touch upon, uh, those are some of the techniques that uh, have been widely employed with LID, with schools, uh, for a number of years now. I wanted to show you just a couple of projects, some individual projects that um, I wanted to highlight. We call them just LID transformation. Now the first project that I ever worked on was in Portland in 2002. It was a school project, the Glencoe Elementary School. And it was a parking lot retrofit. Now if you look closely at this parking lot and you can kind of see the scale of the cars here, very inefficiently designed. Lots of impervious area associated with this parking lot. The tr uh, parking lot stalls, and then more importantly, the travel aisle is very, very wide. By looking at a more efficient site design, we were able to transform this space to allow for, again, a fully functioning parking lot, but we added a stormwater swale, we added new landscaping and street trees, and we added, added a sidewalk that was non-existent beforehand. A couple years later, we had, had the opportunity to look at a middle school that was just adjacent to this, the, the Glencoe Elementary School. This is the Mount Tabor Middle School project. And while Glencoe looked at a singular solution, a stormwater swale to manage the stormwater, Mount Tabor looked at multiple solutions, multiple strategies along uh, at the site. Now this is, a, this is the first project, this is a before condition in 2006 that looked at the south-facing courtyard exterior courtyard of this of this school. And it's got a little bit of parking in there, but again, very inefficient in terms of its uh, layout and its design. We were able to redesign that space to yield about a 2,000 square foot rain garden that accepted water from the roof, it accepted water from the parking lot, a portion of the parking lot, and the asphalt play area that was adjacent to it. It has a more robust entry into the school, uh, didn't have really great bike parking, uh, they have bike parking now, and so there's multiple benefits that are achieved here uh, at, the, at Mount Tabor. So just kind of showing the, the condition here, uh, if you can kind of peer in the background there, there's a downspout that's directing stormwater into this uh, rain garden. Um, and again, focusing on allowing this water to move on the surface instead of just taking it into the ground uh, where it quickly uh, is washed away. Um, after a rainstorm, the water fills up within the rain garden, 
maybe about six inches of water, and then within um, really a couple of hours to a day, that water is soaking into the ground, and it's an ex ex excellent example. And what's great is that the, being right next to the classrooms, the kids can actually see when it does rain, uh, you know, a very tangible um, display of water, our water, uh, moving into the, the landscape space. And so this is actually a, a, a photo that I had taken of, of students, and it actually wasn't students from Mount Tabor Middle School, it was from a, a nearby high school that had come by, and they wanted to try to get some of, this, uh, some of these strategies employed at their school, and so it was a great opportunity for them to learn and uh, inspiring for me to see that they had taken the initiative to come out to the school. So that was a first phase at Mount Tabor. The second phase came uh, a year later, although it looks like I have the wrong date here, it's 2007. And again, I'm talking about multiple strategies. So that was a rain garden space. Now we're gonna tackle this parking lot. And I had mentioned before that the parking stalls were inefficiently laid out and the drive aisles were relatively wide. By consolidating that space, was able to introduce a um, fairly large swale slash rain garden space um, along with a much better pedestrian circulation system throughout the parking lot, much safer. And during the rainy, this is right after it was installed, during the, the, the rainy uh, times, water would be moving through this, this system and it would move from cell to cell as it's moving downhill. Water move, 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 excuse me, would move through. And then within a couple hours, the water would be infiltrated into the ground. So a really nice example of, a, of a, again, a parking lot retrofit, but we weren't really stopping there because we really wanted to do a, a comprehensive uh, job at retrofitting the school. We looked at the entire perimeter of the school as well and started disconnecting the downspouts into uh, uh, landscape uh, stormwater planters. So just kind of looking at how you can cut in these landscape systems with relatively relative ease. And again, these downspouts were plumbed into the stormwater system and we just uh, redirected that water into these planters. And if that water fills up to a depth of about four to six inches, it simply moves into the lawn. And although I've never seen it overflow in that condition, um, it's a very, very cost-effective way to uh, retrofit a site. And the last component was looking at the street. So we've looked at the parking lot, the building, and the street. Um, we introduced a very uh, narrow uh, stormwater curb extension. So we wanted 20 foot of vehicular um, width so uh, cars can move through. And we have a four foot planter system here that accepts water from the street as well. So a very comprehensive look at um, LID. And those were all examples from Portland. I wanted to pull it back closer to home here and look at the uh, Brisbane City Hall rain garden, uh, a project that uh, was completed in 2008. Um, I don't have any good ground photos of the existing conditions, but this kind of looks at the parking lot when it was in its existing state or before state. Again, oversized parking stalls, um, inefficient site design. We were able to transform that parking lot space. And again, we didn't lose any parking spaces at all with that, uh, with this particular retrofit. And we yielded a very large uh, rain garden space. Uh, again, better pedestrian circulation and a truly uh, transformative demonstration project in the South Bay area. And you can tell now the plant palette has switched quite a bit from, from Portland examples to uh, Northern California examples. This was during a uh, LID tour uh, a couple years ago where people were looking at the, uh, the facility, at least in a, in a dry situation. Currently, um, I'm actually working on a project in uh, San Mateo, uh, and it is a, uh, again, a multi-strategy comprehensive uh, retrofit project at Laurel Elementary School. And this is kind of a, an aerial photo of what the parking lot looks like. Their multi-purpose room is the larger diagonal, diagonal um, building there, and it has its uh, water coming off the roof. And we've got a lot of impervious area associated with the, the parking lot. And again, tightening up the efficiency of these spaces 
we can yield quite a bit of, of, of landscape area in the form of rain gardens, planters, uh, and uh, again, addressing pedestrian safety more, uh, more significantly throughout the site. And it's under construction right now. So in the next couple of months, we'll have a, um, a very fresh example of LID transformation. All of these things are very, very important, obviously, for managing water. But the other component is that it's a great opportunity for, for the community, for the students to learn about tr uh, treating the water with more of an eye of conservation, more of an eye of value. And uh, we have a lot of examples of you know, kids being involved in these types of projects, which is excellent. Um, being able to educate not only people at the school, but the overall community about the value of water is an important consideration when you're looking at demonstration projects at school sites. So we really try to engage. Almost every project that I've designed always has some level of interpretive signage conditions so that people know that, hey, this is a lot different than what I've seen in the past. Um, and hopefully they like it. And the ultimate goal is to have students grow up to be environmental stewards looking back at their school and remembering, hey, I remember when this was put in. Uh, and they keep that in mind as they, uh, as they grow and learn. So um, the last part is just looking